So it is indeed a privilege to be with you this morning. Some things change and some things don't. Uh, music still flows effortlessly out of Melody's fingers. And, and yet, if Tara had come up to me and said, Hi, Pastor Greg, I, I would not have known who she was. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you so much. Appreciate all that. The boat still also tilts to the starboard. I see that uh, in the congregation. For whatever reasons, you all favor a, a, a dextra, not a sinistra. You know, it's just the way it is. So, And I see that the back of the boat continues to be the favorite place as well. <laughs> You want to make a clean getaway, don't you? And if I go long, you want to be able to make that getaway, hopefully sight unseen, but it isn't quite that easy. We're not talking about three, 400 feet here. We're talking about 50 feet. So uh, do what you got to do. I'm going to try to remember to do what Pastor Mike does now, and that is not exit. So if you'd like to speak to me, greet me, say hello, I'm going to stay in the sanctuary as I hear he's been doing and visit with you here for as long as you would like, uh, and uh, just enjoy the fellowship of your company. I'm, I'm delighted that we can be together. One other thing changes over time. Over two years, uh, believe it or not, you have morphed a little bit. I see faces I haven't seen in many, many years. I see faces that are new, and uh, I celebrate that uh, with all of you, as well as those of you who were a consistent part of this congregation in my life while we had our time together. Let's just engage in a moment of prayer and uh, let's see if we can make sense of this varied collection of, of texts that I've brought you this morning. Lord, by your spirit, bring your word together that we might be blessed, that we might be taught and informed, that we might be recommitted, that we might be focused as we go out into our weeks and out into the world, we might be strengthened. Thank you, Father. Amen. So we did have quite a little uh, menagerie of texts there, some very positive sounding, some uh, very encouraging, that is to say exhortation uh, in tone, and some very uh, negative in, in terms of what they're pointing out. As you, those of you who know me know I've never been one to beat the pulpit and talk about the end of the earth. But I am an Adventist, as you are, and we have that sure prophecy that there will come a time when the Lord will come in judgment. The earth will be cleansed with fire and all things will be made new. For 150 plus years, the church has pointed to certain signs as fulfilled in Scripture and said, see, it's upon us. And as I've spoken in this setting before, we're closer now than we've ever been. Every day draws us closer to that event, whether in fact it's really near in relative terms or not. Lately, I've become increasingly convinced that the earth uh, may not be a place that can sustain human life for perpetuity, at the pace we're consuming resources. I don't know if you, you watched, uh, you know, you check your, even your online news, but um, one study found that already in seven months this year, humanity has consumed a year's worth of resources. Not sure how they're calculating that, but there it is. The Gulf of Mexico has the largest dead zones in all of recorded, measured history. That is to say, Dead zones are where there's not sufficient oxygen to maintain any kind of sea life. And they believe, ironically, that it's not caused by the giant oil spill, but it's caused by the fertilizers used in farming and the pesticides along the southern coast. A giant, giant, giant iceberg has broken off of uh, Antarctica. And while it's still there and could be there for several years, indications are that eventually it will break into other pieces and move away and uh, melt. And of course, the polar ice caps have melted or are melting, and permafrost, excuse me, permafrost in the Arctic is, is thawing, and Greenland is melting. And so we, we see already uh, changes of these kinds of, uh, brought about by these kinds of phenomena. So I don't say this to make an argument politically, I say this just to say I personally am more convinced than ever that 
uh, for ecological, if, if not other reasons, political, social, war, famine, all those kinds of reasons, the, near is, the end has got to be nearer than we conceive of. And the other piece that is noteworthy is that for many people, we've talked about this before, the end of time is completely relative, right? If you live in a country where everyone around you is starving and you might have 12 days to live or there's no water and you might have a day or two or three to live, the end of the world has just come. You live in the apocalypse. If you live in a war zone and the building next to you has just blown up and the building next to you on the other side has just blown up and the floor above you just got wiped out and the whole family there that you knew has died, the end of the world has come. The world as you knew it. And this is now happening all over. For many of us, the world who have experienced loss, the world ends temporarily or maybe even for a long period of time with the death of a spouse or with the death of a child. Imagine all the places in the world where children are being abducted. People are being taken away into slavery. The end of the world for those folks must feel very real. Our call to worship, and Richard was right, it was atypical. And it pushed us, not pulled us, to an act of worship. An act of confession. An act of realization. I don't know what times were like in the cities that Timothy and Paul were visiting. But I can say this, having visited many times uh, in Israel and, and Egypt, um, Jordan and places like that, the cities that I visited, the ancient Roman cities, had amenities. They weren't entirely dissimilar from cities in which we dwell. And it's in this context that Timothy writes, mark this, terrible times in the last days. And what does he mean by this? He goes on to describe our society very much the way I see and experience it. Lovers of self. Number one philosophy out there. You got to love yourself before you love everybody else. And it's true when it comes to basic self-esteem, we must have personal regard for our own lives and selves in order to effectively care for and engage with others. But this narcissistic insistence that I come first, this love of myself above everyone else and over and above everything else, is not necessarily a godly trait. Lovers of money. Uh, where do I start? Where do I start? The eight this will blow your mind, the eight richest people in Mexico, United States, and Canada combined. Not, I'm not talking about 24 people now, I'm talking about the eight richest drawing from those three, those three areas, those three countries. Own more wealth than the poorest 3.8 four billion people on the planet. Eight people own more wealth than 3.4 billion people on the planet. We hear a lot of talk in politics about the top 2%. But believe it or not, the, the middle class in the United States has disappeared to the point that the 2% mark, these folks, we know, we know these folks. Some of these folks go to our churches. These are people that make two, three, four, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000. That's, that's down at the 2%. The top one-tenth of 1% 1 of people on the planet own a staggering percentage of the resources on the planet. Lovers of money. Lovers of money. Boastful. Who will promote me if I don't promote myself? Proud. 
abusive, disobedient, ungrateful, not interested in God's word or will or way or his holiness or his goodness or his love. They are unholy, without love, for unforgiving, slanderous, without any self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure above God. Ah, and then maybe he's even talking about the church here because he says they have a form of godliness but deny its power. If the people fitting this description are in the church, what are the people outside the church like? It's powerful, isn't it? I'm sobered when I read this because I'm indicted in some of this. By the way I live, by the choices I make. I may think I'm none of those things, but as I look at them carefully and as I listen to the Spirit and I'm convicted, and I look at the way I choose things and the way I live sometimes, I'm convicted that some of these things apply to me too. And so the Spirit speaks. And I'm driven to confession and I'm driven to worship and I'm driven to acknowledge that the only one who can change my reality is God working in me. Amen. I don't believe it's substantially different for you, but I'm not going to speak for you today. My title is ironic because actually if I were evaluating a pastor, and this was the title I had chosen or the bulletin I had chosen to look at his, uh, his uh, you know, work, I would read this, this uh, sermon title and say, Following Jesus in the Last Days, the Pitfalls of Extremism, Egoism, and Nominalism. And I would look at him and say, give me a break. And yet somehow I couldn't help myself. If in fact we are anything approaching the, in anything that is approaching the last days, these are the things though that I want to talk about. And let me just take a minute and define them because they come up in our texts. A pitfall is something that you fall into that may be unforeseen or that you don't anticipate along the way. It's something that you find yourself in or having fallen in but not necessarily having planned to do so. And so when we think about pitfalls, we're thinking about danger points on the journey as we think about what it means to be a true follower of Jesus as we move to the end of time. And the first thing that we all want to do is run home to mama. And what I mean by that is we want to run to the prophecies and we want to cover ourselves in knowledge because we feel like if we can know everything that's going to happen right up into the time Jesus comes, we're okay. The problem is we really can't know everything that's going to happen right up into the time Jesus comes. We have a description of what people are going to be like. We have a general description of what the times are going to be like. But the way to make it through the, to the end of time is going to be through relationship and character. It's going to be something much more personal than head knowledge about what the Bible says about the end of time. But our, our pattern is to do that. And then we start to think about some of the counsel we've been given around Scripture, particularly uh, some of Ellen White's thoughts about city life versus country life and some sort of things. And immediately we want to call up Revelation Realty. You, you don't happen to have 20 acres of fruit trees in northern Idaho that I can buy? Nice little cabin completely off the grid. Solar, but not connected to anything. No? So one of the first things that, that tempts us, and it's a big temptation in our society now, is extremism. 
If you look at, and I'm going to, I hope I don't step on toes, but I'm just going to comment a little bit. If you look at the populist movements happening around the globe, whether you agree with them or don't agree with them, think they're positive or think they're negative, one of the trends is, is they foster a sharp division in each of the countries that represents those populist movements. Often divided politically. In our case, the, the labels are Republican, Democrat, uh, liberal, conservative. These are the kinds of nomenclature that we give these points of division, and they do recognize and acknowledge substantial differences in opinion or even differences in agreement on what constitutes fact. But this division that's occurred fosters an extremism. And it's happening in our church too. Just think about uh, the dialogue that's taken place in the last five years about women's ordination or 10 years versus the dialogue that happened on women's ordination between 1980 and 2010, the 30 years prior. The tone of the dialogue has changed. The tenor of the dialogue has changed. The threats on either side have mounted. The divisiveness has increased. It isn't that we don't still have differences of opinion. We've always had differences of opinion. But the responses to them are extreme and more extreme. You see, when we think about martyrdom as a, a spiritual gift or something that might happen to the end of days, to us at the end of time, we accept at some level, if we've read scripture, that it's possible that for our faith we might be martyred. That is to say, we might die. And we think of that, and that's pretty extreme. But the kind of extremism I'm talking about is not the kind of faith that you would be willing to die for, but rather the kind of faith that you would be willing to kill for. I'm going to let that sink in. What kind of faith would you kill for as opposed to die for? And does that fit any kind of biblical pattern? Egoism is another way of saying egotism, except it's a little more philosophical. And the idea is that we make all of the decisions around a sort of personal universe. So our religious motivations, uh, our social motivations, our financial motivations, everything sort of centers around a personal universe. Ego drives all of it. Now, at some level, you can't escape a personal universe, right? We're embodied people living in a real world with families, friends. We do our thing. We have our jobs. We, all of that is done from the locus of, of an I, of me or you. But egoism goes beyond that. And I'll get more to that in a moment. The final word here is nominalism. And many of you may have heard this word, too. Um, nominalism is... I don't want to overcomplicate this. It is a track or a sort of uh, thought in Protestant theology in general and reaction to Catholicism that comes out um, of the Protestant movement. There's a sort of strain that we would call nominalism there. But mostly I'm referring to it in the popular sense. I'm referring to nominalism here as this sort of uh, uh, lukewarmness. Revelation describes. Religion is a consumerist product that we imbibe or take in. Let me say that again. Religion is something we consume in our consumerist world and society. We're shoppers of religion. We go to different places looking for the best. We go to different places looking for that product that is going to meet our needs most closely. We are consumers, consummate consumers in the society. And I think nominalism describes a consumerist culture religiously. It then ceases to be about personal spiritual change or development. It then ceases to be about service to others or community. It ceases to be evangelistic because it's constantly seeking to meet the need of self. And ultimately, it ceases to reflect the God of Jesus Christ who gave himself in a self-sacrificing way that we might have life. 
Wow, okay, that's a lot. <clears throat> Let me try to tie that to a couple of our scriptures. Revelation 3, 15 and 16 is Jesus' words to the church of Laodicea, which Seventh-day Adventists has, have identified in many, many, many journals, books, articles, sermons by evangelists and pastors as fitting our time, and maybe particularly our church. The writer says, I know your deeds, that you're neither hot, excuse me, cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. And so, because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. There's more counsel, of course, given to the church of Laodicea as there are all the churches. Now, there are Adventist commentators who think that actually all of the churches apply right now. It just depends on where you are. And that, that's interesting, too. But if I pull up this particular thought and take it in a traditional direction, what it points me to is that at the end of time, this last, this seventh church is characterized by a nominalism a lukewarmness. It's characterized not as a biblically founded faith, and now here's where it gets interesting, but it's characterized, again, out of this consumerist, egoist piece. Now, I want to talk about biblical faith for just a minute because it pertains to what we're talking about very deeply. We have a very broad scripture, right? I mean, just, just bear with me. Those of you who know this, put your brain in park or neutral for a second. Those of you who haven't heard this, walk through it with me. We have an Old Testament, the oldest book of which was written a long time before the advent of Christ. We have an intertestamental period in which books were written that aren't part of our Protestant canon or Bible. We have New Testament writings that occurred very shortly after the time of Christ, maybe as early as 55, 54 AD. And we have books that were written in the New Testament as late as 90 AD. But that would be the youngest book in Scripture would then be very close to 1900 years old. The youngest. We have 66 different books that make up our Bible. We have multiple authorship of each portion. The New Testament has multiple authors. The Old Testament has multiple authors. Each of these authors came from their own place in time and history and their own position and their own culture, had their own background and experience that they're interacting with, culture as well. So now this is the complexity that comes to us as Scripture. And when we read it, what we tend to do is take one thing and privilege it over something else. We privilege it. Let me give you an example. Maybe it came up in Sabbath school a little bit. In Timothy, it counsels us that if an elder is to be an elder in the church, he is to be the husband of how many wives? One. We take that and we combine it with Genesis right? In the beginning, God created, and we take male and female being created, and we say Adam and Eve were married on Friday night, and we say the definition of what ought to be is a man and a woman and one. Those are the texts we privilege, right? But there's no mention when we speak of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, no criticism God offers in that portion of scripture at all about the fact that the 12 tribes come from two wives and two of the wives' servants. They were polygamists in the patriarchal period. 
organized that way, and God doesn't ever seem to speak to it or condemn it in Scripture in that way. In fact, when we get to the New Testament, they're shifting things. Things are changing. That's why he says to Timothy, an elder, one who leads the church, should be the husband of one wife. He's not even saying a member. He's saying a leader of the church should be that. So it was apparently permissible for a member to be the husband of two wives. Now, I'm not advocating for polygamy today. I can just hear it. Go ahead, call my boss. I can explain this to him. But I can just hear it, you know. Um, Pastor Greg was advocating for polygamy. Uh Uh-uh. Trust me, I have one wife. She sends her greetings. And if I have two, I'll have none. (laughs) You know her too well. No, what I'm trying to say is we we privilege certain things that we read in our scriptures over and above others and decide that that's what it is that we're going we're gonna to pay attention to. And what extremism does is it focuses in on certain things. It's easier probably to pick on Islam, right? The Wahhabists out of uh, Saudi Arabia and the influence they've had in the, in the uh, Muslim world and the way in which they've influenced the rise of ISIS and the extremism that goes in relationship to Sharia law. You see, there are all kinds of Muslims who live in places where if somebody steals, they might get fined, they might go to jail, they might get a misdemeanor, or whatever. But in some places in the world under Sharia law, you'll, you, you'll lose a hand because that's what's called for. Our own Bible tells us if you have a teenager who is intractably rebellious, to take him out and stone him. And we don't do it. But the problem with extremism is it rises to these levels. It looks at the most uh, uh, outrageous way that we can possibly live together, and it begins to insist that all of these things be kept as equal as we look at Scripture. God isn't calling us to a heat that's extremism or a cold that's extremism. He's calling us to either be in or out. He's calling us to be on his side or not. He's calling us to be uh, on fire, so to speak, that is to say, filled with his spirit or not. Ready to share the word or not. Because when Jesus speaks, he doesn't talk in terms of extremes. He does talk in terms of completeness. He says, love your God completely. That is to say, with all of your heart and soul and strength and with your mind and your neighbor as yourself. This is the whole of the commandments. It comes down to living ethically and loving well. It's very different than what is going on in our society or what was going on in the time of Timothy. Terrible times in the last days. To love God completely and to love your neighbors as yourself is not to be a lover of money or boastful or proud or abusive or quarrelsome or selfish, etc. And we know that we love God and that we love the children of God by obeying this command. I had uh, Ecclesiastes read because I think it says something very, very, very practical. I wish the whole world would read Ecclesiastes right now. Because Ecclesiastes says, ah, you have this thing over here? Yeah, that's a good thing. Ah, and then it isn't. And you have this thing over here, and it's all foolishness too. All is vanity. This, that, all is vanity. Ecclesiastes is the, is, is the melancholy's dream. It's the book for those of you who uh, have melancholy personalities. It's the book uh, of wisdom. And what it does say is this, whoever fears or loves God will avoid all extremes. That's an odd thing to have in Scripture. Whoever fears God will avoid all extremes. And here I go, privileging this text in the middle of this sermon. (laughs) But I privilege it for a reason. 
I privilege it because it's an antidote to some of what I see driving our churches apart, driving families apart, driving our society apart. I privilege it because it's a message that pertains to the here and now, even if I don't necessarily know the intimate details of all of your daily lives as I once did. To be centrist in this sense, to not be extreme, is to be wise. And wisdom, verse 19, makes one wise person more powerful than ten rulers in a city. Philippians gives us encouragement in a different vein. It's a contradiction to the words of Timothy, an antidote, if you will, something opposite. And Philippians 2, 1 to 4 says, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, any comfort from his love, any common sharing in the spirit, if you have any remaining tenderness or compassion, then here's what you need to do. Make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being in one spirit and of one mind. In other words, unity. Not uniformity, unity. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Don't be an egoist. Rather, In humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. As Brennan Manning, the writer, so eloquently put it, we put our arms around one another and we limp to the kingdom together. Because what we have learned by now, I hope, is that all of us have flaws. All of us have weaknesses. All of us have places of brokenness. All of us have deficiency. All of us have places of incompetency. And when we rely only on ourselves, and only on our own wisdom and our own spirits, and when we act only in our own interests, and we think about only our own point of view, we cannot serve the need of another. James speaks and says, basically, if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, at least have the good sense not to boast about it or deny the truth about it. We take this this kind of split of self-awareness on the one hand and all of the kind of confessional pieces that go with that, and we move into a confessional piece on the other side that says, this is how I want to be. This is how I want to live. And a biblical spirituality that will get you to the end of time will pay attention to these texts. Because a biblical spirituality in an Adventist context is this, and make no mistake about it. A biblical spirituality is one that points to and exonerates the living Christ. We say that the Old Testament, Jesus is present in creation. In the Old Testament, he's the one handing down the law. In the Old Testament, he's the one who appears before Nebuchadnezzar in the fire with the three Hebrews. We say in the Old Testament, he's the son of man. We say in the Old Testament that he is the one promised as the Messiah. And we say in the Gospels that he is Jesus, the Messiah, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And we say in the letters to the churches that follow that this new way that has come up around the person of Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Well, he is the way, the truth, and the life. And those who believe in that gather round him with one another and serve the world 
and share that good news with the world. A biblical Christianity is focused on the relationship with and the person of Jesus Christ. And when we start to make everything that we do about that, and when we pay attention to the commands Jesus has given us to love one another, to love our God supremely, our neighbor as ourselves, when we pay attention to his scathing rebuke about the status of our church as lukewarm, and his scathing rebuke to us as individuals about our selfishness and our pride and our ambition and our love of money and our cruelty and our insensitivity and our lack of care. If we can avoid extremism, egoism, children are telling me it's time to be done, so here's the wrap up. <laughs> Extremism, egoism, and yes, nominalism. Let's put them in English. If we can avoid privileging those things that move us away from the centrality of Jesus Christ, if we can move away from making all of our decisions out of self-interest, and if we can move away from a lukewarmness that's based on what will it do for me? We will be the church of Jesus Christ. And it won't be the Laodicean church. It'll be a church ready to live and love until he comes. Pray with me. Lord, I thank you for this congregation and I bless them. And I ask that as we have just opened your word, multiple texts written by different authors over different periods of time, even to different groups of people, and tried to pull them together, tried to make sense of what it is that you have for us. Help us to pay attention to the wisdom of Ecclesiastes. A lover of God will avoid the extremes. Teach us to walk with you and to put our arms around one another, and as Brennan Manning said, limp to the kingdom together. For we see, Father, your arms open wide, and we look forward to that day of ultimate grace and justice, peace and truth, hope and fulfillment. Amen.